are video driving games ruining real racing today on Shakedown. But to get there, there's so much motorsport news, news that I really don't want to cover because of its idiocracy. But I figure I should, because some of you keyboard beaters want to hear me rant. And the rest of you deserve the opportunity to learn things about motorsport and cars and to get your chance to pontificate your opinions, beliefs, perspectives as well. But only two more Shakedown shows before Drive's 2013 year-end break. This one and next week's Shakedown, December 20. So I want each Shakedown to count. And if you haven't heard or been told yet, Drive programming is taking two weeks off between December 23rd and January 3rd from shooting new shows. But if I know this place, I wouldn't be surprised to find a new video or two popping up here on the network during that hiatus. So check into Drive for new stuff or just rewatch some of the great 2013 current stuff because nothing goes better than Drive programming and vodka and eggnog. And four noggers in, even Matt Farah is gonna start looking like Santa Claus. And no, that does not make me, Monkey and Spinelli, the freaking elves. JF is, however, the Grinch. You know, because the Grinch folds his arms, that's all I'm saying. So, what to discuss here on Shakedown today? Well, double points if you guess right, and yes, that's a hint on one of the topics. But not the obvious BS that I'm already reading about F1 paying double points in the last race to keep the 2014 championship fight alive to season end. You know, doing anything to negate another Vettel and Red Bull leadership advantage. No, this show will tell you about the secret logic of how the FIA got to that decision. And it's a Shakedown exclusive, see? I know how to play this internet view count game. And how about we talk a little bit about the news that the new Porsche Le Mans car is a four-cylinder race car. And I can hear some of you guys now. Well, that's like uh, one-third of a real race car because four goes into V8. No, no, no. Four goes into V12. Yeah, I know you can't figure it out because you only have 10 fingers. You better use your foot. That'll get comments. And then there's NASCAR riding the media coattails of our Danica Patrick because she and her house pet, Ricky Stenhouse Jr., did not laugh at some Danica jokes when year-end NASCAR banquet host Jay Moore threw down at the ceremonies. Now, I can't and I won't talk about Danica because A, she's on the shakedown dead to me list when we used to do that, and B, it's never worth wasting time on Danica Patrick. Hey, but if you want more Danica as race car driver jokes, I got pages of them. Let me read you a few. 2013 NASCAR season. The Phoenix race, Danica starts 40th, finishes 39th. The next race, yep, she starts 37th, finishes 33rd. The next race, well, the point is there were 36 NASCAR races and 35 Danica joke finishes. You want more Danica jokes? How about seven years of IndyCar career, 115 races. Her average start, 12th. Her average finish, 11th. Yeah, it's an open wheel, open mic yuck fest. How about her nationwide stock car career that got her into the NASCAR Big Show? That's six years of 60 races. Her average start was 18. Her average finish was 21. Stop the jokes, my side is hurting. And the biggest joke of all, besides the NASCAR fan base, reveling in her fame and accepting this level of performance as a fan favorite, in 2013, the biggest Danica Patrick joke was she made $3.4 million from her on-track comedy stylings. And speaking of jokes, when we come back, the 2014 F1 rules and more. Jay Moore. Too abstract a reference? Let's come back. Before we roast F1 and get to the meat of that story, let's do this Porsche LMP1 four-cylinder story first, especially on the heels of the 2015 Mustang show I just did. And some of you guys freaking the fuck out that Mustang, apparently that you can see only as the holy grail of a four-wheel technology black hole, will have a 305 horsepower, 300 pound-foot of torque, four-cylinder turbo motor as an option. That, in my opinion, that turbo Mustang will be the most tunable, most power upgradable, best weight balanced 2015 Mustang in the stable. But holy sh Ford, what are you doing? It's V8 only, some of you are saying. And others of you are unbelievably mouthing off, where's my beloved rear axle? Really? So let's discuss this Porsche LMP1, 200 plus mile an hour Le Mans racing turbo four banger with power and energy recapture technology that Porsche says will find its way into future Porsche road car development. Hey, can we do this part of the show as a Google Plus Hangout live stream? 
So I can watch some of you more Neanderthal thinking car boys as your heads explode from the concept of technology in cars. Uh, 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 Porsche, uh, four cylinder, uh, Porsche, Le Mans, I don't get it, four cylinder. H how go fast? Where big engine? Boom. <laughs> I want to see that. Okay. It's better than watching the first New York City snowfall, your cranial membra membrane dancing in the air, wafting gently to the floor, making one of my Christmas wishes for some of you dudes come freaking true. Please, please. But here's the real bottom line. The 2014 ACO FIA Le Mans rules say this. There are five energy creation levels of mixing ice, the engine power, and hybrid electric for LMP1 race cars. So you end up with technology options balancing power and economy. And why you have the interesting to me technical diversity of Audi testing their V6 hybrid turbo diesel with very cool aero for 2014, while Toyota builds its normally aspirated V8 gas engine hybrid, but this time with electric power to the front wheels, and Porsche opting for one of those five power options that seem to be tipping to the side of more hybrid power for more efficiency. It's all about being fast, plus saving fuel. And I don't care if a car has eight, six, or four cylinders, turbo, gas, diesel, electric, or rabid fucking hamsters on a friggin' flywheel. As long as its powertrain works, the car goes fast and does the job. And that's perfect. Just get me to the winner's podium, I don't care how. And anyone who want to tell me that this four-cylinder race car wasn't awesome cool, links to this Dan Gurney Toyota Eagle Mark III IMSA GTP car from the 1990s, are right here to make sure that we have the right mindset. We think the Porsche will be a cool LMP race car. And we also think the livery will not be Martini, but linked to the helmet of this guy driving it now. Because I know the agency that Porsche hired to do the sponsorship hunt is the same agency that manages some of the Red Bull F1 marketing activation. So, and I'm really only just guessing here. Okay, F1 time, 2014 rules. Gonna have cost caps, yeah, good luck with that. And driver numbers are going to be assigned to drivers. So is Nigel Mansell coming back again? They'll have five second in race driver penalties. Yeah, whatever. And, drum roll, double points for driver and manufacturers in the last race of the season to spice up the championship, to try to keep it going to the very end to negate Vettel and Red Bull. So apparently F1 wants to become NASCAR with his own version of arbitrary points counting toward the championship. You know, everyone has made comments in the press and on the net, and even Vettel says it's absurd, and others are saying it will change before the season ends, and Lotus F1 gave the world its own list of new rules. Hit the links below. So I don't need to add more comment to the discourse about the rule. My take is to understand how this rule happens. And I think I figured it out. We need to take away from the FIA their Mario Kart video games. That, in my opinion, is where they must be getting their F1 rules inspiration. You know, I went and checked and then compared the F1 and Mario Kart rules, and except for the names of things, they're the same friggin' rules. You want proof of my theory? Here we go. Mario Kart racing starts with the rocket start. Yeah, that's the F1 curves button, right? Mario Kart also has turbo boost. Check that off for 2014 in F1. You hit a turtle shell with the Mario Karts, same effect as banging on the F1 DRS button. The mushroom crowns are again curves. The bananas? Are of course, the F1 rules mandated low grip Pirelli tires. There's a bullet bill feature that makes you fly through the air. Well, other than for Mark Webber, F1 has not yet tried that one out. The Mario Kart star making you invincible? That must be the Vettel factor, right? See, F1 is Mario Kart. The FIA is writing the rules based on this video game, just a bunch of kids with their toys. Now, I can't figure out, can't wait until they figure out how to integrate the Mario Kart babam and spiny shell for exploding your competition. You know, Alonso will be all over that one. And F1 needs the blooper effect to blind other racers and the boo thingy to go invisible, like Lewis Hamilton's competitiveness when it gets lost from time to time, race to race, ha ha ha, freaking ha. Okay. And you know the FIA has associated some of the F1 racers with the Mario Kart characters. Mario must be Vettel. Luigi is there for Weber, or now Ricardo. Yoshi has excellent traction. Make him Kimmy. Toad is small and weaves in and out of traffic. Grosjean. Shy guy is Jensen Button. Wario is the anti-Mario. That must be a Hamilton or maybe Alonso. Bowser's a drifter. That's Hulkenberg. How many teams has he drifted through already? And Donkey Kong must be Donkey Maldonado. See, it all fits. The FIA must stop using Mario Kart 
to make rules to try to make F1 more exciting. And Mario Kart 8 has flying carts, cars. So there's that for the F1 to plan for. <laughs> OK, joke over. But here's the serious point. I suggest that video driving games are ruining real racing, affecting the popularity of real racing, creating the reason why so many car fans think real racing is boring, or they just don't associate it with their interests. Compared to watching the real cars, video games are too exciting with constant action, special tricks, and bonus features to keep the buzz going. Watch the Mario Kart 8 trailer and tell me you don't have a comparison problem with that with real racing. Now, you know video action, action, action. That's what it's all about. Well, in real racing, the IMSA guys are, what, stuck figuring out whether they go diffuser or not for the Daytona prototypes. You guys are freaking out about a four-cylinder Porsche Le Mans car. And F1 is playing with the championship point mathematics like they're doubling down at a Las Vegas betting table. Oh, all the excitement. Plus, even when the video games are more straight up driving versus a Mario Kart, they allow you to drive, not just watch someone else have all the fun. And this BS perception about motorsport being a niche has got to be freaking fixed as well. In the minds of mainstream media, corporate marketers that should be sponsors, the auto industry and the marketplace itself where car fans, current and potential, live their lives. The biggest video driving games have sold the following. Need for Speed, 150 million copies. Mario Kart's 80 million copies. Gran Turismo, 70 million. And then it drops off to many more driving games, but each in the 10 million range, including Forza and Colin McRae at 10 million each. And then under NASCAR, for example, at 9 million. And then the others, but still millions of sales for each game. The total for driving racing games, no less than 375 million. That's no niche, and that doesn't factor in the online sims. So there is a big auto-loving, auto-driving culture slash fan base. And before you say, but Leo, those top games, Need for Speed and Mario Karts, are not real racing, that's my point exactly. This extreme stuff has groomed and indoctrinated a huge mass of car boys and car girls to want, demand, and only be entertained by extreme racing in the action, the rules, and the point scoring. The kids of today may not be real racing fans of tomorrow because the disconnect is so big and boring. Real racing is like the music business. They've got to find a way to embrace the new medium, don't fear it, ignore it, or minimize it by just doing a video game licensing deal, selling game space, selling display space to the video games at the auto race, and be done with further collaboration, or even remedially just trying to sell them on a logo slapping sponsorship, take their cash, and nothing more. Now, maybe Nissan has gotten closest and most creative with GT Academy, but even they have not closed the loop completely. Racing needs video gaming. It's bigger than TV. And video needs the real deal racing. Because where do you think all this interest in driving came from? The real stuff. Sh it's too easy to say all this. Now, what do we do? And what do you think? Is the future of real racing bleak or the opportunity promising? Do we need more extreme real racing rules to connect with all these video gamers? Was our auto racing future defined by that film Speed Racer? And if so, why did that bomb bomb of a movie do so badly at the box office? Time to tell us what you think. Is video game racing ruining real racing? Or it's an untapped opportunity to save our sport? Later, one more later than Happy New Year.